the ocean is vast, deep, and when it comes down to it, extremely indifferent. A force of nature that humans have traversed for the benefits of trade, new land since time immemorial. It is as unavoidable as it is necessary, as thrilling as it is terrifying. From sailing the open seas to surfing coastal breaks, snorkeling amongst unique ecosystems and diving in warm tropical waters, humans have attempted to explore every facet of the ocean. And still, its mysteries remain mostly hidden. To quote big wave surfer Buzzy Trent, waves are not measured in feet or inches. They are measured in increments of fear. Trent faced his fear by being a pioneer of big wave surfing and rising to the perils that the ocean presents on a daily basis. He died peacefully of old age, after years of being a high level athlete. So in a way, he played his games with the ocean and he won. Yet many others have not been so lucky or perhaps so skilled as to surf away unscathed in the face of Mother Nature's ultimate fury. Countless souls have been lost to the sea, swallowed by the endless waves, crushed against the ragged rocks or dragged away in unforgiving currents. The ocean is immensely powerful, unpredictable and filled with creatures that can sting, stab, crush, swallow us whole or send us to the depths of the abyssal plain piece by slowly sinking peace. Fear of the ocean and other deep bodies of water is known as thalassophobia and could be considered a very rational response to a very real threat. The same could be considered of sharks. Though many non-divers see them as people eating monsters, sharks are in reality only responsible for 10 fatalities per year worldwide on average, compared to eight deaths every day in the US from people texting while driving. Statistically, it's more likely that like a cow will fall on you than you'll be torn apart by a shark. However, statistics often don't seem to make reality any more reassuring for some reason. I find the same when people say, you know, you're more likely to die in the car on the way to the airport than you are to die in a plane crash. <laughs> yeah, you're also more likely to survive a car crash than you are a plane crash. People walk away from car crashes every day. I've watched over 18 seasons of air crash investigations and when something goes wrong at 30,000 feet, it usually goes wrong pretty fast. Nevertheless, back to sharks and how they're stochastically speaking, unlikely to eat. However, with up to 300 teeth, distributed on a sort of break one, replace one, conveyor belt like system of ocean consuming death, capable of measuring in at over 20 feet long. Meeting one's end at the jaws of a great white shark or a tiger shark or a bull shark, however unlikely the nature of probability would deem it to be, is still a pretty horrifying prospect. Generally a shark will bite onto a victim and then pull them under the surface of the water for a short time, then release. This is known as a hit and run attack, in a way staking a claim to their, you know, intended meal. The shark may not kill you with this first bite, but they do intend to debilitate prey with the impact and the subsequent injury inflicted, often striking from below with insane speed, silhouetting their prey against the surface light. Hence. Surfers in their sleek black wetsuits are often mistaken for a nice yummy seal. But all that dramatised shark fear-mongering aside, most that have an ingrained phobia of the ocean and sharks more so fear the lack of control that the scenario implies. It's not the ocean itself. 
so much as the unknown that the ocean represents. Much like a fear of the dark. It's the deep, dark, unknown. The possibility that at any moment your body could be clamped down on by rows of razor-sharp teeth. The possibility of losing strength as the carbon dioxide builds up in your lungs. Burning, every cell screams for fresh air. The ability to swim to the surface slowly fades as blackness sets in. As a species, we are wired by evolution via natural selection to avoid death and, when possible, minimise risk. More often than not, when it comes to the ocean though, unlike the big wave surfer Buzzy Trent, there isn't any peacefully passing away in your sleep. The ocean, much like the greater cosmos we all inhabit, is indifferent to our human struggles, endeavours and our best intentions. The ocean is an awe-inspiring and beautiful, yet uncaring, kill-you-in-a-heartbeat force of Mother Nature. The weather had been perfect. The sun sparkled on the water and warmed everything its rays touched. With the occasional bursts of cool breezes intermixed, it really was the recipe for a perfect day's sailing. Brad Kavanaugh was walking the docks of the Annapolis Harbour alongside his friend Mark Adams, both of them hunting for work. A job Adams had previously secured for them aboard a nearby boat had just fallen through and all they had to show for it was a measly $50 each. Now, Kavanaugh came of age in a boating family. He'd survived his first hurricane at sea in utero and grew up on 4,300 feet of riverfront property in Byfield, Massachusetts, where his father, a trained reconnaissance photographer named Paul Kavanaugh, taught him and his siblings how to sail from the earliest of ages. From the outside, the elite schools, the sailboat, the new car every five years, the grand house and the self-made patriarch, it really gave the impression that the Kavanaugh's were living the suburban American dream. Inside the home though, it was a horror show. Always drinking, Kavanaugh's father emotionally abused, insulted and belittled his wife and children. Kavanaugh recalls that whenever he heard the clinking of ice cubes in his father's glass, his stress meter spiked. Despite that, or perhaps directly because of it, all Kavanaugh ever wanted was his father's approval. Sailing, he thought, would earn his respect. Kavanaugh's sister, Sarah, after all had been a star sailor, and at family dinners his hard drinking and Hard to please father talked about her with pride and adulation. Today, however, as Kavanaugh and his mate Adams made their way along the waterfront, Kavanaugh spotted a woman standing by a bank of payphones. It wasn't until she called out his name that Kavanaugh realised who it was. Debbie Scaling. Kavanaugh knew Scaling through his sister, Sarah who had actually first met Scaling when they raced across the Atlantic together a year earlier. Kavanaugh's sister had recently introduced Scaling to Kavanaugh and her family. Debbie Scaling, with her blonde hair and blue eyes, was a dead-set, experienced sailor. As the first American woman to complete the Whitbread Round the World race, during which she navigated some of the most difficult conditions on the planet, At 24, she was already well known in professional sailing circles. And now, standing here at a payphone in Annapolis, Debbie Scaling could hardly believe her eyes. 
at that very moment, she'd just called Kavanaugh's household in hopes of convincing his sister, Sarah, to join a crew she was hastily trying to assemble. And here, right in front of her, was Sarah's younger brother. Scaling was desperately looking for help. She had been hired to deliver a luxury yacht, Trashman, to its new owner in Fort Lauderdale. The owner of this sleek, 58-foot Eldon luxury sailing yacht with a pine green hull and elegant teak trim had made his millions in the garbage business, hence naming his dope-ass new yacht Trashman. The crew delivering his new toy, though, not so well assembled. Unfortunately for Scaling, things had been going poorly from the get-go. The boat's captain, John Lippeth, who was a heavy drinker, was passed out below deck when she first showed up at the Southwest Harbour dock in Maine to report for work. Soon after they set sail, they picked up the captain's girlfriend, Meg Mooney, apparently for no other reason than because she wanted to come along for the trip. Mooney, unlike Scaling was not an experienced sailor, or really, a sailor by any means. From Maine to Maryland, a distance of roughly 910 kilometres, 560-ish miles as the crow flies, the captain, Lippeth, rarely eased the sails and relied mainly on the inboard motor, which consistently sputtered and needed repair. Also, not a great sign on a brand new luxury yacht. Our chances for survival were zero. And it was the most devastatingly lonely feeling I've ever felt in my life. They'd struggled to pick up any additional deckhands as they travelled south, and Scaling knew they needed more qualified help for the difficult sail along the coast of the Carolinas, where they would be exposed to high winds and crazy waves. Scaling didn't share any of this with Kavanaugh or Adams when Lippeth offered them a job, though. Happy to have work and unwilling to question the lucky circumstances the pair suddenly found themselves in, Kavanaugh and Adams accepted the offer on the spot and climbed aboard. The plan was to take the yacht from Annapolis, Maryland, down to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, to meet up with its new owner. The crew of the trash man was now set for delivery. The captain, John Lippeth, a bit of a drunk. His girlfriend, Meg Mooney, zero seafaring capabilities. Highly experienced sailor Debbie Scaling. Somewhat experienced, but maybe not so experienced as Scaling Brad Kavanaugh. And sort of, you know, maybe the same, but even less experienced, probably Mark Adams. It was October 1982. Beautiful skies, calm blue ocean. All in all, the first half of the trip was pretty smooth sailing. Although, as calm blue ocean as everything might seem, It wasn't long before Kavanaugh, along with Scaling, started to notice things that made them a bit uneasy. Lippeth kept making excuses to go below deck, for instance, and Scaling soon realised that their captain seemed to be afraid of the open ocean. Not a comforting trait to discover in a sea captain. Lippeth and Adams had also spent the entirety of the voyage completely drunk. Of the five people on the yacht, only Scaling and Kavanaugh appeared to be capable sailors. I know, right? Isn't that just some spoopy, spoopy stuff? (laughs) That's where this part of the documentary ends, but we'd love to keep doing more. Go listen to the podcast if you want to hear how this story ends, and Jump on the Patreon, help us out, and until next time, we'll see you later.